Welcome to a very special edition of Footy Flashbacks. Today we're taking you on a ride through the decade that has come to be affectionately known as the noughties. Yes, footy in the 2000s was overflowing with highlights as well as the odd low light. Well, today we'll look at all the big moments. We'll find out who took the best mark, who kicked the best goal, who was the best team and the best player. And then there's the category of naughtiest in the noughties. I'm not sure if Dennis Comedian Bruce McAvaney qualify for that one, but they'd definitely be in the running for best callers of the decade. They're with Neil Kearney to help us remember the biggest stories of the noughties. Well, Dennis, Bruce, what's been the team of the noughties? Well, the easy answer, I guess, is Brisbane because they won three, but Geelong played in three and put three years together that uh, Brisbane didn't come close to. I mean, yeah, no argument from me. I think Brisbane were the best side of the... Uh Noughties, I thought they had the full package. I think when you look at their side, perhaps they had things that Geelong don't have. Now, if you accept that the midfields are pretty much even, I think it's down the spine that Brisbane would have them. But, of course, this is all hypothetical. You can play the game in your mind, but uh, it proves nothing at all. But just on that, one Saturday afternoon changes the whole argument. Hmm. If they beat Hawthorne in 2008, and they'd lost one game, then I reckon both of us would be saying Geelong. So I, I think over a whole ten years of footy, one afternoon changes my answer anyway. Well, one afternoon would do it, provided they played each other. Mm. And we can't, we can't do that. The game's changed so quickly, and the speed of the game has increased so much, that from Brisbane to Geelong, have you noticed how much faster the game's been? Well, certainly the interchange has become the tactic of the noughties. Some drama here on the interchange bench. Gee. There's five Collingwood players there. Five. So maybe the paperwork hadn't been done. When I came back calling Dennis in 07, I actually thought the game was slower. And there was a lot yes. of kicking the ball back, there was a lot of stoppages. Now suddenly, probably because of the interchanges and a couple of rule changes, things have quickened up. And right now, everyone's talking about it. I mean, it's the buzz theme, how fast the game is, the collisions, the hamstring injuries, etc. Mitchell streaming down the edge of the corridor. He's not oh. quick. The tackling was the biggest change, I reckon, in 10 years. I mean, because Stevie Moore wouldn't have made a tackle in the early noughties, would he? Well, not he one. No, probably not. And probably now, not. if he doesn't make a tackle, he doesn't get a game. It's, that's the bottom line. I guess the noughties saw the big power shift away from Victoria from 2001 through till 2006. Victorians find it hard to accept, not, yeah. not only in the grand final. Look, the, the, the decade started with a powerhouse winning, uh, losing one game. <laughs> and finish with another very strong team basically being unbeatable as well. So we start with Essendon and Geelong, but in the middle, you know, the Brisbane rain, and then all those consecutive grand finals without a Victorian team, and then the next one without a Melbourne team. So, yeah, look, it was, a, it was I think, good uh, in so many ways. Hard for Victoria to take, but I live in Adelaide and you live in Perth, and I thought in many ways that it was the coming of the national competition. And some of those grand finals, I mean, the West Coast Sydney grand finals mm. were memorable. One of the Collingwood-Brisbane grand finals was First a beauty, yep. uh, so the day itself lost nothing. Fraser makes the lead, it's all over! The Brisbane Lions are premiers again! Here it is! Now we've got a wonderful competition by any standard in the world. In fact, I think it's probably the most egalitarian competition there is in the world. Let's talk expansion for the moment. Uh, North Melbourne had the chance in 2007 to go to the Gold Coast. Should they have gone? I think so. Uh, I don't know the answer, Neil. I, I don't. Well, my feeling is that there are too many clubs. This is an unpopular view, but there are too many clubs in Victoria. It makes it harder for them to win. It's as simple as that. I mean, uh, Geelong is not in Melbourne. 
they've got their area. So they're almost examined exclusively, I think, of the Victorian clubs. Then you've got Brisbane winning those three on the trot. You've got Sydney, West Coast. I don't think it's an accident. I think what they can bring to the table in terms of getting their teams to be successful is greater than what the Melbourne clubs have got. Towards the end of the decade, towards the end of the noughties, Gold Coast and Western Sydney were announced as new clubs. Will they succeed? I've got this feeling about the AFL. I think their management, particularly of this group in charge of the AFL at the present time, has been quite outstanding. They're criticised on the micro issues, rules and things like that, which th that's easy to do. But in the big picture issues, I think they've been very good. Now, I've got doubts about Western Sydney, but I don't claim to know enough about it. When I look at that, I think, gee, that's going to be tough, whether they can do that or not. But I feel until such time as they make a blue, I'm backing them, because I think they've done a terrific job. I'm excited. I think when you're standing still, you're going backwards. And I, I think that this is a very good time to take a massive chance. It's one of the biggest chances the AFL will ever take. It's a huge expenditure. They're going into um, a territory that uh, could be daunting in many ways and, and, and not so friendly, but I think it's the right time to be making the move. And they're throwing the two of them in basically at the same time, which I think is good. And I think long term it'll be seen as a masterstroke. What's been the moment of the decade for you? Oh, geez, that's, look, it's, it's so difficult. Um, it, Dennis, is there one moment stands out for you? Uh, well, no, other than seeing success-starved clubs like uh, Sydney, like Brisbane, uh, Geelong. It's been a long time since mm. those clubs have been successful. So uh, I always like to see the battlers get up if they've been down for a while. It's very hard to pin down one mm. thing, Neil. It, it really is. But, you know, I saw the best game of football I've ever seen in my life in that decade, and it was last year, it was round 14, not far from here. Two teams, 13 and 0, we'll never see it again, ever. And they played a match to die for. It was St Kilda and Geelong. Mm, mm. It's the best game of footy I've ever seen. I don't think I'll ever see a better one. Dropping back is Revolt. It's in his ballpark. <laughs> the kick, the result, the roar. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy with that call all round. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks, Bruce. Yes, yeah, so many stories and so much change over just 10 years. Sadly, we also said goodbye to three AFL Hall of Fame legends. Their memories, however, live on. Essendon sweeping all before them in the grand final of 2000 and it looked like they were going to be the dominant force of the era but as soon as their era began it seemed like another one took over. The Brisbane Lions and their coach Lee Matthews. Lee, tell us about Arnold Schwarzenegger and Predator. Oh, well, that was going into round 9 or 10 of the uh, 2001 season. I think we were about 4 wins, 5 losses, something like that. And Are you always looking to have a little theme that you might be able to get your teeth into? And I, I just used to love that line in the Predator movie where... He, 
he finds that that alien that they can't kill because they can't even see it bleeds green blood. So I thought that's a nice little theme. So I got the scene from the movie on the Tuesday before we played Essen who'd hardly lost a game for about two years and said, well... If it bleeds, we can kill it. If it bleeds, you can kill it. It was kind of a little theme uh, that we... Uh, well, it was an, an in-club theme, really, and that, that became a little public. Combining now with Ashcroft, the 268-game veteran. Can he go all the way from 51 metres? Over the top he goes! That's the one they needed. The Lions are still alive. We'd won 15 consecutive games going into that grand final, so we were in really good shape, fit and well, everyone available, um, and uh, we were ready to go. They've done it. He's got the ball in his hands, Bruce. A bit of history here. Lee Matthews has been to the top of the mountain for a second time as coach, once at Collingwood, and now he's done the impossible. Brisbane have won the Premiership. You've won 2001. Let's go now to three-quarter time, grand final 2002. Freezing day. I think you're up by four points at three-quarter time. Anthony Rocker has a shot for goal in the last quarter. Anthony Rocker to put Collingwood back in front of the MCG. Anthony Rocker kicks it behind. Did you get a view of it? The line of the ball, I thought it had gone through. Because it was 100 metres from the goalpost. And it was such a tight game. You know, seconds and inches win or lose grand finals. And that was just another example in that particular game that that, uh, that ball didn't go through, so it was a behind set of a goal. Alistair Lynch got a free kick, um, you know, that was the, probably the second last goal of the game to put us back in front. So it was a really tight game the, uh, the whole way through. Do you remember, Lee, what you said to the runner to say to Jason? Go and tell Acker, run to the front of Lynchy. Run to the front, front not to the back. Front and square. At the full of the ball, Acker. That's it. The coaching box thought that Gary O'Donnell, it was his thought, not mine. He, he said, Akers, keep him to run to the back of the pack. You know, tell him to run to the front of the pack at the, mar at, at the marking contest. So that was the message, get to the front of the pack. And as history would turn out, there was an Alistair Lynch marking contest, front of the goal square, ball comes to the front, Akers at the front of the pack and kicked the left, really good left foot goal, which was the final goal of the game. It must have been reassuring for you that Acker always did what you told him. Acker always did what I told him, mostly. <laughs> <laughs> it's just Fraser for Collingwood and Kitty for Brisbane as the grand final of 2003 is underway. They lost Anthony Rocker uh, suspended. That was always going to be a big out for them. And uh, uh, well, that's when Nigel Lappin had the broken ribs and they were able to uh, get the painkillers in sufficiently to get him on the field. Um, and we had a few players that were a little bit, uh, a little bit wounded going in, but uh, the other 18 or 20 win a uh, really good shape. But uh, as it turned out, the game was a fan. Our guys just turned it on that day. They were fantastic. Well, who got the tackle? Went straight to Carousella. Who goes? Ackermanis roaming free. One bounce from Acker. On the brink of something great, Jason Ackermanis goes to town. Handball straight to his opponent in Keating, who handballs into space. Hadley runs on. Oh. He's gone without it. Lynch gathers. He's got loose men everywhere, but he decides to have a punch shot. And it's an absolute ripper. Here it is. The Brisbane Lions have done it. In this very competitive era, winning three premierships in a row might not happen again for another 40 or 50 years, might it? Well, it might. I think Geelong's last three years have been better than in the Lions' three years um, in terms of win-loss. They won, was it, 65 out of 75 games. I mean, they've totally dominated three years. Yep, got to the three grand finals, but obviously lost the in-between one uh, to Hawthorne. So, yeah, getting that jigsaw puzzle together three years in a row, that sort of defies the logic and percentages because, again, so many things have to come together to finally win on grand final day. Well, you're playing Port Adelaide in the 2004 Grand Final. How many players were so injured that they shouldn't have played? Oh, no, we weren't. Actually, in fact, in some ways, we were better equipped going into the 2004 uh, Grand Final with injuries. But like Alistair Lynch, for instance, uh, hurt his hamstring in round 22, got on the field on Grand Final day, was to be his last game, and he was therefore, you know, uh, just not, 
not properly fit really. Um, Jamie Charman, our main ruckman, had got injured in the middle of the year, so we're a bit, we're a bit short on ruckman going into the grand final. Um, so, and I think, uh, well, I'm convinced to be honest, that Port Adelaide were a much better opposition on the day in 2004 than probably the, the three previous years. So uh, we were fading a little bit. A lot of players that were mainly, you know, getting towards their last uh, year or two, and uh, and Port, you know, uh, were able to uh, just just really overwhelm us in the last quarter and a half. And that was a memorable gesture of Mark Williams with the tie and getting rid of the choke, I think. Lee, how come you've never done anything with your tie or um, twirled your jacket or...? Yeah, no, well, I guess, uh, I guess the, uh, the, the coach's box environment's a very, uh, a very tense one. I mean, I always thought footy's much better playing, but on grand final day, coaching is almost better. And of course, that's the only thing you hang your hat on, really, when the team wins on grand final day and there's no next week. Who rose to heights that you didn't expect? Um, well, Nigel Lappin was always one of those. Uh, he was part of the Fab Four, but was really the, uh, the unpublicised. And the courage that he showed to get on the field with what was really a crack rib in 2003 was one of the most, one of the most courageous things I've ever seen. Did you doubt that he'd do it? Particularly when I'm pretty sure he played the game with a punctured lung. I'm pretty sure, we found out after the game that he had a punctured lung. Pretty sure we punctured his lung in the fitness test on the Friday night because about an hour before the game when we had to make a final decision, Nige, are you okay? And he said, I'm not feeling any pain but I can't seem to breathe in properly. Finally, Lee, if your Brisbane side of the early part of the decade was to play the Geelong side of the latter part of the decade, who's going to win? I might still fancy that the Lions of that era could take them, take Geelong. Yeah, I'd still, I'd still back the Lions. Thought you'd say that. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, Mel. I guess no surprise Lee went with the Lions. Coming up, we give Cats captain Tom Harley the right of reply. But next, we take a look at the new rivalry to emerge mid-decade and the breaking of footy's longest drought. Yes, the crowds as colourful as ever grew to record numbers during the noughties. By the middle of the decade, two teams on opposite sides of the continent had formed an unlikely rivalry. In a run starting in 2005, Sydney and West Coast met six times, where incredibly every game was decided by less than a goal. 
right in the middle of that run were the two very famous grand finals. Let's relive them now. The season deciders of 2005 and 2006. Cox to Kerr. Runner up in the Brownlow brilliantly to Fletcher and Judd. Three of the brilliant four. And now Nikoski can have the first shot of the grand final. And he drills it. And Dean Cox is in the clear. The 204 centimetre giant. Can he go all the way from a long way? Oh, this is a magnificent effort. He's done it. Crouch with four or five to beat. Oh, Does well done. brilliantly. Buchanan now. Just got it onto his boot. Still a chance. Schneider it is. Can run in and he loves these. And he picks it away. It's quickly. Hall. Oh. Front and centre is O'Loughlin. Couldn't snare it. Goods can! Goods! Swings onto the left. Embley scrubs the kick. Canelli got a bad bounce. Hanson! Hanson's nailed it! Sydney by eight. Very difficult kick for goal. I tell you what, he might have nailed it. He has! Throws it onto the left. Looks for Gardner. Outlets! Oh. oh, stuck up the right mitt. What a crucial mark, and they're all crucial in this last oh, point. Oh, the square up! Cross the face of goal. Cousins awake to it. For the first time since the first quarter, Eagles are in front. They've won four of those six. Buchanan puts them in front. You call it in one, Robert. You call it in one. Heads along the boundary line. Oh, good mark by Cox. Cox throws it onto the left. One last roll of the dice for the oh. Eagles! Leo Barry, you star! Bob Murray, William Kurt. The longest premiership drought in football history is over. For the first time in 72 years, the Swans are champions of the AFL. As McVay and Cousins get into it before the opening bounce, we're away in the grand final of 2006. But it's a high ball inside 50. There's Matthews, can't take the one-hander. Roberts Thompson mops up. Buchanan under pressure. Under real pressure. Off the ground! Judd's got it! On the next line, Hunter across to Cousins. He's been running all year and he's finishing strongly. O'Loughlin made the call, stayed behind and he might get the rewards. Fletcher can't stop him, and O'Loughlin puts it through, he's got three. Off to Embley, puts the foot down, Andrew Embley runs to 50, and... Oh, he's got it, has he? He barely raised a sweat. As McVay gives Hall and the Swans the first chance, they are going as the Brownlow man, the Brownlow man! From the side was Roberts Thompson. Schneider, Schneider! Stendline, the hurried one. Got to be tough. Armstrong steps up. Oh, he steps up in the best possible way and punches the air. He's on his wrong side. Right O'Keefe, now on the left, straightens up towards goal. And might have gone through. O'Keefe's got it. Sensational goal. Buchanan put the head down. Got it out to O'Keefe. Oh. Kick smothered. Check. Hunter. Bolton's coming. He's still coming. Bolton. Buchanan was there waiting for it. It's a hot ball in the pocket. He's still going, Buchanan. Out to Malcheski. The young man, Nick Malcheski. He's kicked it. Oh, there's one point in a pandemonium at the MCG. Can the Swans do it? sequel would be just as good as the original. The West Coast Eagles are the premiers for 2006. And the Stars, Cousins and Christian now have the medal they really want to put around their neck. 12 years of disappointment over for West Coast. They have won their third premiership in history. And this time, the heartbreak is suffered by the Sydney Swans. Ah, oh, great games, both of them. And I guess one flag each, in hindsight, was a fair result.
In 2007, however, the Eagles and Swans were pushed aside as a new power took over. Next up, we look at the final three grand finals of the decade and the emergence of Geelong. Geelong are the premiers for 2007. Inside players, well, if Paul Hazelby was any more inside, he'd be a pancreas. It's working back, and he's missed. More easy misses than you'd find in Desperate Housewives right here. To Carr, just the one car family that offers tonight. Prez, David Morgan, must have thought his boys were back, but dare I say it, a stunned dog millionaire. Sliding in was Harvey. Good pick up Graham. In trouble, the old stripper Graham. It's kicked forward out there by Thompson. Ah, yes, some comedy gold there. Definitely one of the most popular commentators of the decade. Well, at the start of 2007, the Cats had gone 44 years without a flag. Three years later, they were considered one of the greatest teams of all. Neil Kearney is with their captain, Tom Harley, to remember the three grand finals to end the noughties. Well, Tom, Geelong went 44 years without a premiership. How was the label of handbaggers? I came over to Geelong... Uh, perhaps a bit naive at the time, but thing I was coming to a club that was a, had a really proud, strong history. Played in four grand finals in seven years, although they didn't win them. They were, they were a strong, successful club. Surely they're going to be financially secure and all that kind of thing. Um, but at the time when I arrived, and, and you don't think about it as a 20-year-old, but the club was in a pretty, pretty ordinary way. 2007, you have 15 game winning streak, you finish the season three games on top. Yep. What had changed at Geelong? Uh, just to, I think the, a, a bit of player ownership. Um, a myriad of things changed. We, we, we were more specific and professional in the way we prepared physically. Um, we committed to a, to a game plan, um, win, lose or draw. We were more concerned. We said, look, if we... We went in that season going, we, we were going to devise a plan inclusively with the coaches and the players. And if we implement and commit to implement and fall short, well, well you live with that. But, uh, you know, we committed and we, got, we, started, we started to see the flow on effect. So an absolute commitment to that. And then confidence was massive. Here we go. The record's on. In right. Oh, to me. That final series of 07 was probably when we were absolutely flying. You know, we were... I think playing as good a footy as any side that I can remember playing in, in the uh, probably that decade. And Ablett, the little genius, drives it home. Looks a chance from inside 50. Slapsy Maxi. Nathan Ablett for two in a minute. And Chapman can run in and finish the job. Harley Harley. Oh, Chapman! They've got a couple down there. How good was it to take the Premiership Cup? Yeah, it was, it was massive. It was just, uh, just the achievement of... Uh, and Geelong's was special, I reckon, just because of the, you know, the, the pent-up emotion and the 44 years, and, and uh, it, was just, it was just brilliant. A lot of difference between being a Premiership player and being beaten in the grand final, isn't there? Yeah, no doubt. Massive. Massive. It is more devastating to lose a grand final than actually euphoric to win one, which is... Uh, which is an interesting sort of uh, analysis. I still, so we got beaten by Hawthorne, um, who played out of their skins and uh, deserved the premiership without a doubt. Um, and, you know, brown and gold still burns my eyes. Hawthorne were very good, very clever, structured their season really well and were without a doubt the form side in September. They, they were the best team for the month of September and that's all you need to be. To Bateman, hard running, can kick a goal. In front, a chance for the Hawks. Williams, Ruffhead turns around and kicks another one. Brown, wasting no time. Bacon Square. This has got to carry. 
Campbell Brown. Had a oh. crack at it. Oh. He's in trouble. That's Harley. He's in a bit of strife. And right and Rioli. Rioli, brilliant here. Absolutely brilliant, Rioli. Rioli thought about going back. Now he's got the crown. Franklin didn't take the mark, but all is well. Surrounded by Hawks. Strong tackle got him down by Bateman. Hodge, Jew, kicks a goal. Gives it back to Jew. He's in desperate trouble. Hen passes back. Williams goes in. This is a throw. Still with Franklin, though. Now Jew could kick this, and he has. He's had the best five minutes of his free life. And Franklin. Oh, he's done it. He's done it. He's put the arse on the cake. Hawthorne, the champions. Did the loss in 2008 become the great motivation for 2009? Uh, <laughs> it became a motivation for 2009 at three-quarter time of the 2009 Grand Final. And I'm not joking, that was the first time it was brought up for the year. By Mark Thompson? By Bomber, yeah. And what did he say? He said to us, he said, look, we haven't spoken about it, but if you want to take anything out of the 08 season, um, just remember what it felt like to lose the Grand Final. Because you're in a situation now where this game can go either way. Not underselling us as a team or inflating St Kilda as a team or anything like that. Just said, just if, if, you, if you're flagging and you want just that little bit extra, have a think about that. There were so many moments in 2009. Which one sticks out for you? Uh, oh, oh, the, the one at the end is, is, is the, you know, you know, when you're talking about, it's, it's pretty fitting that um, you know, right at the end of the decade of footy, you've got, in my in my opinion, the most important goal of the decade was Chapman's goal at the end, and just just the, the passage of play that led up to it, the, the arm wrestle of the game, um, how Gary Ablett got free in the middle of the ground, the toe poke from Scarlett, long into to the, the contest and the Chapman goal it was just uh, it was brilliant. You know, that's um, that's that's the the overriding uh, memory from the game for me. The 09 Grand Final will go down in folklore as legendary, I think. Rooks after left Clark and he got him. It was a Max Rook play. Is it a Max Rook kick? It is. He has the first goal of the Grand Final. A long ball's a beauty to Mooney. And on the second bite, he's got it. Needs it. Ball kept him honest. Well done. Hawkins! A specky! Hawkins gets the six points. Geelong. Head over the ball, Selwood goes for home, and he calls it in. The two on two, Taylor went to ground, Kuzitsky, he's kicked the goal, and scores a level again. Handball comes to Revolt, Revolt, oh, what a smother. And Montagna at the front, will put some colour in front. Varko, handball's over, it's a snap, ball Chapman. It's over. The Cats' vindication has arrived. So, which would you say was the best team of the noughties? Was it the Brisbane Lions from the early part or Geelong from the last part? Be one hell of a game, I reckon. Cats of, Cats of 07 versus the Lions of uh, probably 0, 02 Brisbane Lions, I reckon. Yeah, tough question. What did Lee say? <laughs> I agree with him. <laughs> Brisbane. Yeah, of course he did. Of course he did. That's all right. Good stuff, but I guess we'll never know who was right. Still to come, we look at the best marks and goals of the decade, but next, it's the biggest news stories of the noughties, including one match in Tassie that shall be forever remembered as Siren Gate. Opportunity for Priyo, they left it behind. That was Hedlund, and the ball is locked in again. And I think the clock will stop again. How many seconds to go? What are they appealing for, the Dockers? Fiora across the Baker. Baker lines up and kicks a point. No, 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 the siren's already out. Yeah, the umpires have to work out now. In effect, we have a tie. He's going out there, Chris Connolly. Well, this is appalling. The siren was so hard to hit. In comes Baker. And Baker has kicked another point. Does the previous point stand? We have no idea. Really? We don't know who's won the game or drawn the game. The right thing's got to be done. The team that deserves to win when the siren goes deserves the four points. Two 
137 days ago, Jason McCartney's world exploded literally. Bob tore the heart out of Cooter. He managed to make his way to hospital burns, which covered 50% of his body. Weeks on the critical list. Recovery is nothing short of amazing. Have a listen to that. Signed the 50, McCartney behind. He's taken the mark. Jason McCartney knows how to trick them. And listen to that roar. McCartney top points it. Picked up by Harding. He goes in. Another lead change. Fairy tales do come true. I find it fitting now that I'll uh, hang the boots up as of tonight and go out on a great note. You know, it's been hard carrying the hopes of the nation, I can tell you. Welcome back to our look at footy in the noughties and Jason McCartney's comeback match in 2003 would definitely count as one of the most emotional days of the decade. To help us remember all the other big news stories from the 2000s, Neil Kearney is with Tim Watson. Well Tim, do you think that Jason McCartney's comeback 273 days after the Bali bombing was the most touching moment of the noughties? I can't think of one that was more touching than that and I think it's because everybody knew in great detail what his story was. That night, that game, the way it played out. He kicks inside the 50. That awards full forward, runs the ball. McCartney toe pokes it. Picked up by Harding. He goes in. Another lead change. Fairy tales do come true. I think it probably was the most profound moment. Well, the naughty started round 1 2000 with the opening of the new stadium, mm. Colonial Stadium. Mm. Barnes scouting to Long, 40 metres out, close, he's got it, Michael Long's kicked the first. What difference has that venue made to the competition, to the clubs, to the fans? I think the fan actually enjoys going to Etihad Stadium, I think they like the comfort of Etihad Stadium, it's probably changed the way, it's probably more, it's more, probably had a more, more of an effect on the fan than it actually has on the game itself, I think that they enjoy the fact that they can go there on a Friday night, or any night for that matter, during the day for that matter, during the winter months, and they're going to be watching their football in real comfort. A lot of the noughties seem to be about footballers being naughty. Um, is it that footballers are naughtier than they ever were, or is it just the scrutiny? The scrutiny, yeah. Footballers are far less naughty than what they were, um, going back to the... To your day, Tim? Oh, yeah, exactly. 70s, 80s and, and 90s. I mean, they're far better behaved than they've ever been. All right, well, let's talk about... The biggest personality probably of the noughties, Wayne Carey, in mm. March 2002, the whole world exploded for him. I regret the circumstances of my actions which has led to the decision and the pain it has caused to my wife and my family. I apologise to all my teammates and all the kangaroo supporters. What did Wayne Carey do so wrong? Well, it was about trust and, you know, that's one of the most important things inside a football club and particularly when you're a leader and you're the person that everybody looks up to and he broke that trust with himself and a teammate and other people in that football club and destroyed the unity of that football club for a period of time and it was such a massive story because he was the number one player at North Melbourne, perhaps the biggest name that's ever represented that football club. And then in 2007, Tim, we had the Ben Cousins saga. To me, Ben Cousins and to a lesser extent Wayne Carey almost seem like rock stars. Mm. His behaviour would be acceptable amongst rock stars in some generations. Oh, okay. It'd be applauded in that. Yeah. Yes, but the world of football doesn't see it the same way. No, because there's the sport analysis and the sport connotation about that. and I, I, For some reason, we put our AFL players up on a pedestal and we ask them to be role models for children in the community but we don't necessarily apply the same rule to rock stars. And the Blues are fed up. We know how good a player he is on the field but off it, it's one indiscretion too many. Favola, do you think Carlton cutting too much slack or not enough? Uh, too much. Yeah, I think they're too forgiving of his behaviour along the way. Ireland woke this morning to front page headlines of the wild man. Favola had been refused service. Too drunk, said the barman, who was claimed Favola then punched him in the face. This was Favola at 4.18am on Saturday morning, unbuckling his pants, then, according to witnesses, urinating on the window of the candy bar venue in Greville Street, Paran. The Didac Shaw drink drive incident in 2008? 
Right now, football appears to be the least of Collingwood's worries. When you have two of your key players looking the president, the coach, their own teammates in the eye and actually lying to them. I'm very disappointed in myself. The public have had enough of this situation. No more. How serious was that as an issue for Collingwood Football Club? Extremely serious. Uh, the issue itself was extremely serious. And then the fact that they didn't tell the truth at the time and the club came out and lied unknowingly at that time on their behalf. It was an embarrassing situation for a football club. and. It was an embarrassing situation for the players too. So Tim, in that whole decade of the noughties, who was the naughtiest? Well, we're talking about a long list there. I guess, uh, you know, we, we've already talked about Kerry and Cousins and, and Fev and Dynak and Shaw and other players getting involved in misdemeanours off the field. But I think there's one that probably tops all that and that's the Bulldog mascot, Butch. Going pretty well at this point. Finds the opposition hey. and says, you know what we're going to do to you tonight? <laughs> you know what we're going to do to you tonight? We're going we're to roll you. I think, you Disgraceful, know, it? Yeah, you can excuse the behaviour of those players, but what, what Butch has done, and he's a repeat oh, offender as well, uh, I just don't think that you can turn a blind eye to that. Mm. He, he might have got away with it 20 years ago, Butch, but there's probably a bit of the Butch in all of us, Tim. Yeah, I've seen some of the stuff Butch has got up to, and I must just say I've never anticipated doing that. No, OK. We'll, we'll put Butch out of the way. Thanks, Tim. Thank Cheers. you very much. Yes, no shortage of drama both on the field and off it. Still to come, we'll uncover the best mark and goal of the decade, but next we'll find out exactly who was the best player of the noughties. <laughs> Melbourne, S.Y. Woden. Much pleasure in declaring Jason Eckermanis the 2001 Brownlow Medal winner. Simon Black is the 2002 Brownlow Medal winner. The captain of the West Coast Eagles winning the Brownlow medal by one vote for our West Coast. James Bartel is the last football player. Brownlow medal, Adam Cooney. I declare the winner of the 2009 Brownlow medal, Gary Ablett of the Geelong Football Club. Some great names indeed, taking home the Brownlow medal throughout the decade. Well, the big question is, who was the best player in the noughties? That's no easy question. So to help us out, we've gone to the experts in search of our answer. Turn around, left foot snap, that's a miraculous goal! Bones away through, it's a goal! He's got eight. Makes sense of that. Remarkable! Look out! Oh! That is a miracle goal. It is extraordinary. Most exciting player of the 2000s um, would be Adam Goods. Couldn't snare it. Goods can. Goods. He is uh, a dual Brownlow medalist, so he's yeah. got the runs on the board. When he gets the opportunity to break open a game, no one does it better than Goodsy. Goods, oh, what a leap! Straight up into the night sky. That's so difficult because at the start of the decade, Kerry was on the wane, and Heard was still a factor, and Buckley was there. To Voss was there and Robert Harvey was getting towards the end and we've had so many great players and then since then there's been Judd and there's been Jonathan Brown and Nick Revolt and Pavlich I think should be mentioned. Pavlich plays on, thumps it long, gets up into the house down, oh how the path! The best player I've seen for a year is definitely Franklin. This will be interesting, Lake and oh. Franklin, oh gee he's so good isn't he? <laughs> that is a miracle goal, he's extraordinary. I like watching uh, Fev, and you never quite know what's going to happen with Fev, and I think all the fans love watching that. And Buddy from the Hawks, his year in 2008. You know, I watched a lot of Hawthorne games just because of Buddy. You know, Buddy Franklin, a couple of years ago, <laughs> I started to see things performed by him that I'd never seen before. He would be bringing in an extra 10,000 people a week just to watch 
Buddy Boy do his thing. Buddy Franklin is the player that I want to pay my money and go and see each and every week. I've got Nathan Bassett very high. Uh, <laughs> he'll be so pleased. He sent me his boots and I've got to sort of even up with him. Uh, I think I said one afternoon that he was like your favourite uncle who did crazy bird calls. Everyone loved him. How courageous, how courageous was that? It's a toss up between uh, Franklin and Bassett. The captain of the decade, that's, that's a good question. I think you'd probably have to go with Voss with the three flags that Brisbane won. And I just think that he epitomised and represented all the great things about our game. Well, simply from a personal point of view, if it's my team of the decade, I want uh, a yes man, someone who's very compliant. Um, unfortunately, Tom Harley and uh, Chris Judd don't fit the bill, but I think I'm stuck with them anyway. Ah, oh, Bucks! Oh, no. He'll never forgive me. Bucks! Uh, well, he didn't win a premiership. Uh, and I don't know that in any of those grand finals he won the toss. I mark hard. I think James Hurd stands above those, those other men. I would have loved to have um, gone shotgun with him uh, throughout some matches, especially in 2000. It would have been handy to have him down at the Demons. I'm going to go back. I'm going to go to the old guys. And it's a toss-up between Hurd, Voss and Buckley. But I reckon the best captainship I saw was the grand final Voss v Buckley. Buckley wins the Norm Smith medal and Voss produces a grand final last quarter to die for. I just love those two guys going to head-to-head -head that day in that grand final. For me, Nick Revolt, he is the most unbelievable forward uh, of the last decade. Nick Revolt's the best forward. Just got all the tools. I think he's about six foot four, six foot five, can run all day. Uh, one of the most, if not the most courageous players. Good look out! Oh, Revolt, remarkable! Uh, my best defender of the, of the decade would be Max Hudgston from St Kilda. Obviously, Matty Scarlett's right up there. Uh, I rate him very highly, but I actually played on Max a lot more. Never, ever got a kick on him, but I don't think I ever, ever had a good day on Max. But great spoil from Hudgston. Uh, Matthew Scarlett's the best defender. He's a uh, four or five time All Australian. He's and a proven grand final performer, too. Very stiff not to win the North Smith medal in, in 2007 from fullback. The best player I've, saw, I've seen this decade is Chris Judd. Under real pressure, off the ground! Judd's got it! He's a star. Uh, and I think he'll go down as one of the great players we've ever seen. I'm going to go Nick Rewalt. His work rate is unbelievable. His you know, ability to push himself to run, his marking, and you know, just his ability to lead his side. Three times voted the, be the best player in the competition by his peers. Uh, won a Brownlow in, in, a, in a premiership year and won two best and fairest in premierships year. And I don't think you get too many players that would argue, uh, argue too much about Gary Abbott being the best player of the, uh, of the decade. Revolt I like very much. Jonathan Brown I like very much. Ablett terrific. Chris Judd. Oh. I mean those sort of players don't come down the pike every five minutes. And there are plenty of others I've left out. But those players I love calling. I, I, I always loved Hurdy, uh, James Hurd. Behind the pack, can he do it again, James Hurd? I think he may have. I thought that when something had to be done in a game, and probably if you go back over his highlight reels, it's not going to be that spectacular, but he actually had to put what he did in context as to what was happening in the game at the time, and I just thought that uh, he was an extraordinary player. I think Buddy, um, you know, wait, because when he got the footy, he was running so quickly and he was so big and he would charge to the 50 metre line and could go anywhere. I mean, he kicked 113, 88 or something ridiculous. He had so many shots. But I think for that one year, he was the guy uh, because they weren't just marking kicks. A lot of them were impossible almost to visualise and he did it. So I reckon, buddy. On 99 goals. What a field. I'm glad I didn't have to choose. It doesn't get any easier though when next up we try to pick the goal of the decade. There were no shortage of candidates. Here are just a few of them. Grant's got, it. Grant's got it. This is the sort of goal that the champ might kick here. Got it's it. a good it. He's kicked it. I made never so effort. He will be a hero forever. Here's Miranda. Paddles it across the 50. Off oh, Wade Shepherd from Williams. Gearing bypassed by Miranda. Still he goes, Mark Miranda. Still he goes. This could be oh, a goal of the season. Oh, what a goal. Davis keeps it alive. They just swan. Swan back to Davis. Another ripping goal from Daniel Williams. He does it every week. Now Kerr can keep going. And does. 
And does some more. And some more. Surely he couldn't for 48. Oh, he has. It's Bill's for him. He can't do it. Brown, Scotty Lucas. A magnificent goal. Possible angle. Oh. Welcome back to our very special flashback to footy in the noughties. And didn't the advent of umpire mics add an extra dimension to watching football on TV? Time now to find out who kicked the goal of the decade. The Wiz is going to weave some magic. Oh, <laughs> done by it's the banana. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, <laughs> comes Watson. Goes with the outside of the oh. boot and kicks a freakish goal. I think the banana came more in vogue towards the second half of the decade, and in particular the Indigenous boys. Clicks it across to accommodate Betts, and Betts kicks a miracle goal. Well done, Davis. He's good enough from here. Magnificent. Leon Davis had a he had a really purple patch there for uh, uh, 2008. And it trickles close to the line. Davis, a master in this situation. And uh, just slotted them from all over the shop. Guys that do it consistently, you know that they're not fluking it. Occasionally, you know, guys like me can even fluke a banana goal, but Leon does it all the time, so I'd go Leon Davis. Davis works, Gasper underneath it, and then goes across oh, with a no. check side. Oh. Has he done it? Oh. He has. Of course he has. Buddy Franklin, I think uh, when he was on fire, then the whole stadium was up, and it was really something special. Buddy, no. could he do no. it? No. Could he do no. it? Is there anything the man can't do? I suppose Steve Johnson just a head away, heads are bobbing. Steve Johnson's here, around the corner. <laughs> what do you say? He is amazing! But uh, Franklin for mine simply because uh, that season he produced is one of the best of all time by any individual, no question. He's got plenty of tricks, Buddy Franklin, and that's just the first today. Well, I've liked Acker. I've liked the way that he's gone about his business and the fact that uh, he's made the most of half opportunities. Akamatis takes him on, backs himself, now you see him, now you don't, pulls a rabbit out of the head, kicks a goal! But there's only one, he plays for Port Adelaide, Daniel Motlop, he is an absolute superstar, whether it's along the ground, in the air, at training, he, he could be kicking them down the Monash freeway. Motlop, anything could happen here. One way, then the other, from the pocket, kicks to what goal? Can you believe that? If I had to put my life in someone's hands to kick a banana goal, Daniel Motlop, my life is with you. Use of the body was good, has numbers around him, wants to go solo though. Oh, with the outside of the man. right boot, <laughs> some individual brilliance from Motlop. I think the most important goal I can think of straight away is a Nick Davis goal at the SCG, off a stoppage. You know, pretty hard, had to get it straight to his boot uh, and at a crucial time right at the end of the game to uh, basically, at the end of the day, they got into a grand final after that and if it wasn't for his goal, they wouldn't have got there. The Swans need a goal! Nick Davis! Nick Davis! I don't believe it! The most important goal, without a doubt, was 2009. Jack Anthony, he gets a free kick in the dying moments of the final against the Crows. 
Collingwood are out if he misses. And you knew from the time it left the boot, it was never, ever going to miss. If you're a Geelong supporter, it's obvious. It's, you know, a scraggy left footer from a bloke with no hair. Late in the grand final, um, with number 35 on his back. Farco, handball's over! It's a snap Paul Chapman! And Chapman's kicked the goal! Easily Paul Chapman's goal. Uh, grand final, 2009. Not the most spectacular goal, but in terms of uh, importance, a bit like the Leo Barry mark at the, uh, at the death of a, gr a close grand final, sealed the victory, and he's a teammate, so I'm biased. Invariably, you hear commentators say, that's goal of the year. That's the goal of the year. Because goals are hard to measure, and a lot of them have remarkable similarities. I suppose Rioli's goal out of a pocket, I think it was against Richmond, that was quite outstanding. Rioli, somehow through traffic, it would be a miracle! Oh. Best goal, Eddie Betts, it was, I think, about 2006. I think uh, a lot of players can do the spectacular things. I think if, the, if a great goal is work rate, um, around the ball, repeat efforts, and if you can pull off the spectacular after that, uh, that gets my vote. The smother by Betts, kept it alive. The impossible goal! <laughs> goal of the year, Eddie! I think one that springs to mind straight away for me is uh, Daniel Motlop up at the Gabba. Uh, the reason I like this one is it's a banana from the wrong side of the ground. It's bending the wrong way for what it should to go in. Outside 50, Motlop oh, with the outside of the foot. I mentioned the big bag of tricks. That's home. That was from the bottom. Well, I wouldn't even try it. It would have gone out in the full too. <laughs> There's only a special type of player can even attempt something like this. <laughs> I'm going to say something a bit off field. There were two goals at Geelong in round 21, 2007 that were back to back and they were so different. Gary Ablett weaved his way through, and I don't know how he did it, and kicked the goal to win the game for Geelong. Buttons goes to one knee. Ablett's got it. Finds a way through. It's a goal. And then within a minute, it seemed, Dominic Cassisi, who can't kick a left footer over a jam tin, managed to kick a left foot goal on the run and port one. Cassisi to win it. Cassisi does win it. Oh! I just love that minute. History repeats itself. I think Leon Davis has kicked some of the best goals I've seen, but I remember Acker kicking a goal on the boundary line in really wet conditions up at the Gabba one day, and I just thought that was just the most remarkable goal. Again, oh, well no. on the handball, no timed way. it brilliantly. Can he no top way. himself? He can't top himself. Oh, that's my mouth. For me, Leon Davis does it week in, week out, but the one at Subiaco where he's able to thread it from the boundary line. Davis on him, fetching it, oh. doing brilliantly, Davis. This will be a goal. This will be a goal. No. It is. That goal at Subiaco is one of the best goals, not of the decade, that I've ever seen. That is as good as it gets. Still he goes. This could be a goal of the season. Oh, what a goal. Brilliantly oh. done. Superb. What a goal. Ah, yes, some magnificent goals there, and as we're about to see, the marking men too reached some unbelievable heights in the 2000s. After the break, we'll reveal the mark of the decade. from the side. Who's a... Oh! And Lloyd! Oh! 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 What a ball! <laughs> Sensational! Burton! Oh! That's one of the marks of the century! Through and Bateman gets through and kicks the goal. Oh, oh, 
Indigenous players did it all in the noughties, winning Brownlow, Coleman and Norm Smith medals. Could they also claim best mark? Well, they certainly had no shortage of candidates, as we hand you over to our noughties experts to find out who took the mark of the decade. Brett Burton and, uh, and Russell Robertson were probably the two most spectacular, consistent high marks. Will he fly? Oh. I reckon I've still got stop marks on the back, on the back or the shoulders or wherever. Burton lurking. Oh. I don't think coaches necessarily would love this guy because they didn't all stick, but Russell Robertson, I thought uh, he was pretty excited. Robertson! The Birdman's hard to beat, uh, Brett Burton. I mean, he's not that big. Um, Robbo was similar, I mean, probably a similar height. Deep in the Robertson! <laughs> you think, how do they do it? So, I think for consistency, those two guys are way up there. Look out! Oh! He's spectacular and he had that great ability to be able to launch himself into a mark. Brian Lake's another one I like. Brian Lake, a defender, takes a good mark. The Flyers Lake! He has actually mastered the crash landing after the big leap. There are better things, I think, to be good at. I think early in the decade, probably Tony Modra. He took a lot of his marks in the previous decade, but Modra, at his best, could take the biggest hangers you've ever seen. Oh, I love Richo. Uh, you loved Richo going for the footy. Richardson! That's why they love him. He wasn't the best mark, but he was the most exciting because he put his body in angles and positions that no one else was able to do. Yeah, I think when you're talking about most courageous, you know, you think about going back with the flight and one of Nick Revolt's up in Sydney was absolutely outstanding. But look out! Oh, Revolt, remarkable! Nick Revolt, I reckon. You know, just uh, he took a, a absolute classic up in Sydney, running back with the flight. Um, Jonathan Brown did the same. He got mark of the mark of the year one year against the Hawks. Oh! Otto's a massive guy. His nickname's Pill because he's got a massive head. Otten's one of Will he ever come down? But he's got massive hands as well, and I think he's one of those guys that when he gets his hands to the ball, he really drops them. Over my time at Geelong, he was probably the, the, the best mark, I reckon. But Otten's oh, one about that for a moment. Barry's the one that's the lasting one in the grand final. And you know the other one? Michael Gardner takes that mark against Geelong. Could you imagine if that had been the grand final? Revolt. It's in his ballpark. Leo Barry saved a grand final. Michael Gardner wins a home and away match. So it all depends on the stage. The kick, the result, the roar. Without a doubt, the most important mark of the decade was Leo Barry's mark in, in 2005. One last roll of the dice for the oh. Eagles! Leo Barry, you star! I guess, you know, people talk about kicking a goal after the sirens being a, a boyhood stream. That, that would be mine, I think, a, a Leo Barry style mark. I think the best mark of the decade would have to be Leo Barry, simply because it was the most meaningful mark of the decade. I think uh, other marks are remembered from week to week, month to month, year to year. But I think that one, when we talk about marks, is going to be there. Well, eternity's a long time, but for a long time. The best mark of the decade, I reckon, came in 2009. It was uh, Brett Burton for the Crows against Carlton. Burton! Oh! That's one of the marks of the century! Had the works, it was a pack mark, he was on a lead, flat out, took it, got a great ride, so uh, he gets my vote. Ashley Shampy, that is the best mark I've seen in the decade by a long, long way. A driving ball forward. Oh, oh, Shampy! All of a sudden you see this bloke, Ashley Shampy, rise. Now I'm about 300 rows back and he looked like he was parallel with me in flight. I think Gary Moorcroft's mark at Etihad Stadium that night was just unbelievable. He hooks it back. I can just still recall him going up, 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 thinking, you know, is he ever going, is he ever going to stop or come down again? He just went, boom, and I was calling at the time, and it just took my breath away. The one thing I do like about it is one of my best mates, uh, Ben Harrison, is there with his opponent sort of shepherding him out where he should have come over the top and spoiled, or else that mark might never have happened. If I didn't say that, no, that was special. I'll tell you how good it is. It'll be on CNN. <laughs> that was unbelievable. It's getting better. <laughs> ah, yes, I'm sure we could argue over that one for a very long time. 
Well, that's our take on footy in the noughties. I hope you've enjoyed reliving it all as much as I have. There are certainly some wonderful memories. And I hope you can join us again soon when, once again, we delve into the vault next time on Footy Flashbacks. Oh.